Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You all okay? All right, first of all, a, a very big thank you from me, well, myself and Mike, to you, because um, I think the group of people outside must, must have been intimidating to some extent. Um, I find it interesting, well, this is my second time in Swansea, but I didn't quite expect a response like this tonight. And I, I believe that the Labour leader of Swansea City Council is amongst the people outside. Um, he's been told what the talk is about, but he seems to have his own conception as to what's happening. I'd like to give a very big thank you to um, Samlet Social Club, because over the last three days, the management have had to endure phone calls trying to warn him off and warn people off from attending. Uh, because uh, this is an extreme right-wing meeting, apparently. And tonight, Swansea City Council phoned, I think about five o'clock, but earlier this afternoon, uh, to tell the management of the venue that I was National Front, which, of course, is complete and utter nonsense. Um, what it tells me is that the establishment is starting to get very, very frightened of the fact that people are waking up to what's happening. And we know around the country that local authorities are getting particularly unnerved at the speed at which people are beginning to understand what is being done to their children. So I, I think that the attempts to smear myself tonight and by implication the people who attend to see what I'm talking about is a sign that Swansea City Council are beginning to get very, very worried about ordinary people waking up. And they should be, because when people around Britain discover what has really been going on, not only over the last 20 years, but over the last 50 years, there are going to be some people I think would want to go away and hide. Now, one of the things that we consistently say, and I'll repeat it at the beginning of this meeting so there's no misunderstanding, Everything that we're doing is being done lawfully and we don't need violence of any kind on the streets even when we discover what these people are doing because ultimately they have to be brought to proper justice and I suspect you won't be surprised that I'm going to say as a member of the British Constitution group that that justice will be uh, obtained under common law and not uh, under, administrat uh, under administrative law, which is causing the problem at the moment. Okay, so, uh, it's, yeah, where do we start? It's a big subject. It was about five years ago that I started to um, get interested, is, is a little bit of a, it's not a very good term, is it? Because nobody wants to start looking at suicides. But there were suicides starting to happen around the country, and uh, I became interested in what seemed to be pockets, clusters of suicides. And as time went on, it was obvious that something was going on in South Wales. I did a little bit of research myself, but then uh, started to speak to a lady locally, um, who, locally to me, um, Plymouth area, who, who was also watching what was happening. And we had a cup of tea one day. And she said to me, I think they're doing something with the young people. Um, after that, there was a bit of a pause. And then for, for a variety of reasons, I started to get interested again, I'm going to say probably about two years ago. And we w we've been doing work in the background. And it's taken until now to really find other people in South Wales who had enough concern over the subject to pass information. And then we decided the thing to do is, is to get a team of people together, do a talk, see how it goes down, and then we'll take it from there. But one thing I assure you, I'm going to do this in the most sensitive way possible. I'm not going to show faces, and I'm not going to talk names, and I'm not going to talk detail of cases. Um, we can approach this in a, in a very sensitive way without going into that detail. Is this going to work? Because it didn't last time. Obviously not. Okay. A little bit of advertising. Um, how many of you have had a UK column before? 
on, on, online as well. Okay, well, there's a few copies at the front. This is the front page. You are privileged to see the front page of the latest edition. It was only printed today, so we haven't got copies. Um, but we're aiming at the Leveson Inquiry. And why are we doing that? Because we are convinced that what is going on in the Leveson Inquiry is an attempt to actually put government control right over the media and press. And uh, I hope you'll get hold of a copy of the column where it, when it comes out. We've published quite a lot of detail, but we are warning that what this corrupt conservative Lib Dem coalition is doing, and I'm going to say it is with the Miliband brothers in the background, is they are attempting to introduce state control of the press and media. If they achieve that, then we are in a very, very serious position in this country because, of course, it makes it more difficult to get the truth out. So that's why we're doing that front page. Well, I've got quite a few clips from the papers as usual, and I thought this might be a good uh, opening one. Um, and it was basically saying the community was shocked at what was happening. So you are local people, I'm not. Does this slide capture the mood, do you think, of the area with what's gone on? A few nods, okay? I'm the outsider, I'm also English. Okay, so I, I haven't come here to tell you everything. I've got come here also to ask questions. But this was a slide that I thought they have spoken of their shock and are at a loss to understand why 17 people have actually committed suicide. And these were some of the things that I, some of the comments that I picked up from the press um, that were saying that um, they were quoting parents and friends of families were saying. We need to sit down and think of ways to address this. We need to bring it to an end. Do you think that's happening? I thought I'd try and put very simply, and also because I knew people are going to be watching what I'm doing and saying very carefully, I thought I'd try and put down why I'm here. And what I'm doing is, is trying to work with other people to save people's lives. It's not just a question of what the young people are doing by committing suicide. It's the fact that all of us at the moment are in a very peril perilous position. And if, if we don't have our children, we don't have a future. You might have children, you might have grandchildren. And that's your life, isn't it? You go, but you feel quite happy because you're your children are going to live on. And if somebody's breaking that and getting at our children, we don't have a future, so we need to do something about it. And who's going to do something about it? Well, the answer is we are. We are going to do something about it, but we can't do anything about it unless we understand what's actually happening. So what I'm going to do tonight is to try and show you what I think is happening, and then we can decide what to do. Just a little bit of history on me, because various people say various things. Uh, I did 21 years in the Navy. Um, I was a warfare officer, and I tracked Russian submarines around the ocean for most of my time. So it was my, my job to be out there with a lot of other people trying to keep the Soviet nuclear submarines away from the British nuclear deterrent. And if you've ever seen Hunt for Red October, it's quite realistic as to what was going on. But when you did that job, you also got a little, well, a little bit, you got involved in the intelligence side of life. And so part of my professional work was looking at intelligence pictures and putting information together and deciding what was really going on. And that was my job. I was trained to do it. I was professional. I like to think I was quite good at it. Um, eventually, I headed up the um, anti-submarine training uh, for the Royal Navy at Portland and I went over to Holland for two years and worked as an instructor with the Netherlands Navy and then I ended up um, commanding HMS Orkney which was one of the offshore protection vessels also involved in fishery protection and my time at sea I witnessed the absolute destruction of the British fishing industry so I had the pleasure of boarding foreign fishing boats 
that had been paid for by European money while British fishing boats were being burnt and broken up. And uh, my story is that one dark stormy night in the fourth, Firth of Forth, I boarded a Scottish fishing boat and he was using the wrong nets. And my instructions were to confiscate his nets. And he said to me with some pretty strong language, you are destroying my effing life. And I knew that what he said was true. And I was so disgusted with the whole process, that was the trigger that actually made me leave the Navy. So I'm just saying very gently that uh, I do know a few things. Now this is quite an old um, 2006. It was a little cartoon that appeared in the Telegraph. And I thought I'll have that cartoon because the moment I saw it, it meant a lot to me. So here's the little man looking at the poster and the poster is saying, have an appropriate day. What does that mean? Can anybody tell me what it means? It's new speak, isn't it? It's not have a good day, have a nice day, have an appropriate day. And of course, the little smiley man has got the hammer and sickle. And when I saw it, I thought that's a very interesting little look at what's happening in the world. And it took my mind back to military textbooks, which talked about psychological warfare, psychopolitics. And this is a definition of psychopolitics. Can you read it? Can you all read it? Or shall I read it? But the significant thing is that it's talking about creating chaos in a society as a way to taking over that society, breaking the society down until people are so demoralized that they will grasp at any political straw given to them. Now, the man who wrote this, who was actually very, very intelligent, was called Beria, and he was Stalin's head of secret police. He was very intelligent. He was a total psychopath. He enjoyed torturing people, and he liked to get involved personally from time to time. And he, of course, died in a violent way with a bullet through the back of his head. But this was part of the doctrine which came out through that era and into the Soviet system when I was at sea in the 1980s and the Cold War was on. This was the type of doctrine that we knew was out there. People who were burying, burying away in the background to destroy open Western democracies by subverting and pulling them apart from the inside. And I'm going to say that my training made a big impression on me because a lot of the stuff I was taught, I knew and I learned for myself, I knew it was real. And one of the great things that I realized was when the BBC said that the Berlin Wall came down, it was the biggest lie ever told because the machinery that existed in uh, Eastern Europe before the wall came down still existed after the wall came down. And one man has written a whole book on the fact this was a con. There was a guy called Christopher Story, who's unfortunately dead. It's a very heavyweight book with a lot of detail. But don't believe that evil systems have suddenly disappeared. They've simply changed form. I'll come back to that. And what the Soviets also said is that uh, if somebody gets a bit close to saying what they're up against, what they're doing... The way you destroy them is to defame them. You degrade national leaders. You get in and accuse people of being what they're not. Or you accuse them of being what they really are. So if they're Nazis, they call you a Nazi. If they're Marxists, they call you a Marxist. And this is a way that you gradually pull people apart. So I was very interested when all of this hassle started tonight... Well, it started two days ago. This is a screenshot. I know you can't read it. Uh, it's from the student activist diary. And a man who says that he's a Muslim is saying that this meeting is going to take place tonight. And he's saying that Brian Gerrish is a well-known fascist and he also hates Muslims. Now, what is interesting about this diatribe is that, of course, it's completely false. But the man clearly doesn't know that not only have I given talks in Birmingham Central Mosque, I have an open, in, open invite to talk there again, which I am going to do. So 
So that there's no misunderstanding, around us in Swansea tonight, we've got some very, very nasty people who won't come and listen to the truth, but they will sit there and try and undermine people. Let's be frank. I have no formal medical training. I'm not a counsellor, but I'm not a member of any political party. I don't now believe in political parties, and I believe anyone who's elected to Parliament should be as an independent, they should be an individual, and the whip system in Parliament, which is, I've, as I've discovered, not only unlawful at common law, it needs banning tomorrow. So that's me, and what, I, what, what I'm going to talk to you about uh, tonight comes out of my personal knowledge, my professional capacity, but I don't have any formal training in the counselling area. But this is it, isn't it? Something's not right. So I got this little diagram from one of the newspapers and it was giving a dispersion, dispersion of some of the suicides across Bridge End. And I thought it was a, a fairly neat little diagram. And if we have a look at that on the, the map, we can obviously see where that is for Wales. Now, I know you guys know where you are, but people who are watching the video don't. So we're just putting this one in so that they do know. Now, this was a little diagram um, from the Office of National Statistics talking about the suicide rates uh, in Wales in dark blue and the Bridge End area in light blue. And, of course, this thing hadn't actually caught up with what was happening. But if you go looking for statistics on suicide... In some ways, there's a lot, although it tends to be very historical, and in some ways, there's not a lot, because if you try and get into detail, you can't actually find the statistics. And I'm going to say that I phoned several organisations uh, about a month ago now trying to find detail of what was happening in this area, and I was very surprised when I couldn't find the detail. It just made me think a little bit. So I'm going to ask you the question, how many suicides have there now been in the Bridge End area? Can anybody tell me? I've got a bid for 17. Anybody else know? Because I don't know. And I'm going to say to you, isn't this interesting that everybody said they were desperately worried about what was happening to the young people, and yet when we asked, well, how many have committed suicide, all of a sudden we don't know. Now, I'm going to say to you, I'm pretty confident that the total is over 40, and it's still going on. Now, one of the reasons that we don't know is because the press were told not to report, but we'll come on to that. You can't read it, and I'm quite happy because there are names on this, but this is a list of some of the people who've committed suicide. And if you were to see it close up, what it will read is hanged, 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 hanged. There's one carbon monoxide poisoning, hanged, hanged. Now, if you look into suicides, and it's not a very nice subject, but we're going to go through it, you will find that there's a natural dispersion. It tends to be males that commit suicide by hanging, and females tend to prefer cutting their wrists or taking drugs. Of course, there are mixes, but there is a separation in the way it happens, and yet in South Wales, all of a sudden, we are seeing everybody commit suicide by hanging. Something's wrong. And parents know that something's wrong, but when we start to look at what the public authorities are doing, it gets more wrong, because as far as I can see, they're not doing anything. And the fact that you as a community don't know the total number of suicides in your community is extraordinary. If you look at other documents, you find some very interesting things. So this is an article I found, and what it was saying was, well, basically, um, areas in Britain are now starting to show suicide rates as high as in African countries where people are suffering under extreme poverty. My goodness, this is an interesting state of affairs. 
Now I'm going to say, is this true? I'm going to accept the report because I think the report is true. But here we are in a so-called civilised Western democracy where we can feed and house ourselves. We should be able to employ ourselves. And yet we've now got suicide rates which are rivaling countries with terrible conditions. So why is this happening? Now the press have said some interesting things. So I've got here a selection of papers. I'll just take my watch off because I'm pretty bad at letting the time run away. And, uh, well, you can see it there. The, the big one on the top left is saying that it's to do with mobile phone masts. Do, do any of you know anything about that? Okay. Let's, we, when we come to questions, we'll, we'll do some stuff on that, but that's good. I think there could be something in this because I certainly believe that... Um, this type of radiation is dangerous. If you're on board a warship, every aerial has a danger distance around it. It doesn't matter whether it's UHF, HF, EHF, or super high frequency, there's a danger distance. And a lot of modern electronic communications is directly equivalent to the microwave that cooks your dinner. I hope it doesn't. So that was interesting. But some of the newspapers are actually getting to the grips, grips to the fact that nobody knows why this is actually happening. So there's everything from internet cults uh, to the fact that um, some of the youngsters were linked together in so-called satanic or occult groups. From the research I've done, that was only a couple of them. But really, we didn't get many answers out of the, uh, the press. Now, this is where some interesting things started to happen because um, some parents, quite rightly, I think, got upset that some of the press started to get a bit extreme in the way they were reporting suicides. And it says here that Bridge End MP Madeline Moon, is she here tonight? Well, that's strange, isn't it? Because surely, surely your MP would be, wouldn't she be desperate to know why young people were committing suicide in her, her ward. Sorry, have I said something that's unreasonable? <coughs> Does anybody agree with me that it's strange the MP isn't here? I'm getting a few nods. Come on, let's talk about reality. So where is she? But what happened was that the pre press were actually told that if they reported suicides... Are you leaving, gentlemen? Okay, brilliant. Um, some of the press reports um, were being accused, basically, of leading to copycat suicides. Now, this is a risk because it does happen in certain instances, but it's a very difficult and fine balance because if the press doesn't report, how do we know what's going on? But what has actually happened is an almost total press blackout now on the fact that the suicides are still going on. So one gentleman told me it's 17, I'm pretty confident it's over 40, but nobody knows. So now we've got the situation where young people are committing suicide and we, adults, family, friends, the community, do not know how many. I think this is very, very serious. Now, when we start digging into a little more detail, and I've made several phone calls just as a member of the public, and there are other researchers who've been doing the same, we found that actually there was a lot of reluctance to talk about what was happening. It was almost like you were a bit of dirt if you phoned up to say, look, we're trying to find out what's happening about the suicides. Now, I'm not blaming this gentleman. I'm just saying that when we start to dig into what the coroners had to say and which coroners were ha holding which cases and what the police had to say, we've come up against a rather muddy, murky little wall. It's almost as though the establishment doesn't want to talk about what's going on. And that's a bit strange because I think they should be desperate to find out why these youngsters are killing themselves. But this man did say he was desperately concerned about the chain of young suicides and he was particularly concerned with social <laughs> networking sites, and he's talking about Bebo and MySpace. 
So how many of you are regular users of the sort of internet, Facebook, and one lady, one gentleman? Okay. I know how it works. I have an occasional look on it, but I don't really know a lot about it. But what I do know is young people are into it all the time. And there are some youngsters who spend hours on it a night. So we might get pretty interested as to what they're getting their minds into and who they're actually communicating. So if you're a mum or a dad or a concerned relative, knowing what youngsters are actually into is pretty important. And this is, uh, well, this is the Welsh Assembly. Uh, Health Minister Edwina Hart revealed officials are preparing the action pan, uh, plan. I'm not doing well tonight, which will offer counselling in schools. But she insisted the problem affected the whole of Wales and was not solely in one area. Well, I think that's a bit disingenuous, really, because clearly there was a problem in Bridge End and there still is a problem. So why would she start to spread it out while it's happening in Wales? What would be more interesting is if she commented about other places in the UK where there are suicide clusters, of which Aberdeen is one location, where they've had about 90 93 suicides in three years. And I can tell you that in Northern Ireland, there are other locations where they're getting suicides in a very, very small geographic area. So the last I heard on Northern Ireland was about 11 people in a nine-mile radius. So what's doing the damage? I think that this lady is more concerned with massaging the figures than she is actually getting to the bottom of what's happening with the children. And the whole time that we don't pin her to the wall and say, what are you doing about it? The longer she goes on, hiding in the shadows, not doing anything about it. Now, I'm going to take a little sort of detour here because I'm going to try and introduce some information. And I'm going to get on to this organisation, Common Purpose. Now, I've done a lot of talks on Common Purpose, but I haven't really dealt with it with the angle I'm going to deal tonight. And don't worry, because I'm not going to give you two hours of common purpose. But we need to have a little look of it. How many people in this room know something about common purpose? Wow. Thank you very much, because that brings a smile to my face. Okay. This is the chief executive, Julia Middleton. Uh, I've got a new photograph of her, which I might try and find for you later, because it's particularly fine. But this is her giving a talk. Unfortunately, because of the light, you can't see her eyes. But if you look at her eyes, they are very wide and staring. And she's got quite a strange expression on her face. But I put up on the um, internet a while ago a video in which a guy had looked at her talking and he said to me that she was using NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. So although she was talking, she was actually using techniques to interfere and manipulate the way people were taking the information in. I don't think this is a very trustworthy lady, and obviously we published a lot of stuff about common purpose, but I'm going to come in, as I say, at a slightly different angle. Just so that we know what the organisation's really about, this is um, an anniversary conference in 2000, at which somebody picked up some of the people who were there. And one man who was there with Julia Middleton is Jeff Mulgan, special advisor to the Prime Minister at that time, um, and uh, also involved with the Department of Trade and in Industry. And he became heavily involved with the campaign links to Labour. But he was part of a secret committee that was looking into the way the Labour Party was operating um, involved with the European Commission, etc. Uh, we had some other people connected with the Fabian Society. Okay, Mike, if you will. Um, sorry, just come back a bit. Sorry. Um, if you look right down at the bottom, uh, there was reference to a Labour MP, Tom Dryberg, uh, which the person had labelled KGB spy. If you dig into politics, a lot of people that we think are old school Tories, old school Labour, have got some very interesting backgrounds and some of them have been very, very deep in their politics. Yep. 
And we, we've got to recognise this because it has an impact on what's happening in this country. Now, this is um, just a little thing. We'll come on to common purpose. But it's a... Um, well, it's a conference up in Westminster, and it's talking about transforming teacher status. Is anybody in the room a teacher or been a teacher? Okay, just one. That's good. Well, why do we need to transform teachers? What does that mean? Can anybody tell me what transforming means? We could say changing from one state to another, but it would be useful to know what we're changing from to what we're changing to. And this doesn't say, it only says transforming. And here in the audience, we've got good old Julia Middleton from Common Purpose. And we've also got um, Matthew Taylor, who was working in one of the big um, institutes for public policy research. Now, the only reason I'm showing this little thing is to say, I can show that Common Purpose is always working at high levels of government. They're always involved in change and transformation, but they never actually say what they're changing from to. And that's very significant because I believe they're hiding in the shadows. Now, I started to say that common purpose was interfering with people's minds. And about three, maybe four years ago, they set up a separate website which was called Common Purpose Net. And on it, they challenged everything I was saying and gave um, answers. And so they say, does common purpose use brainwashing techniques? Well, the answer is no. And then they describe what they're doing. So they say that common purpose programs are using experiential training techniques and a set of conventions. And that's pretty interesting language to me, because what does it mean? But when you follow it down, they tell you because they start talking about a gentleman called David A. Kolb. And if you go and do your work on Mr. Kolb, what he was looking at was how to actually interfere with the way people think and how to change their behavior. So I'm gently going to say that Common Purpose says, no, we are not brainwashing people, but what they are doing is interfering with the way people think. Now, I, th I thought I'd enjoy this letter here because back in 2008, Julia Middleton was getting extremely worried that I and other people were beginning to delve into her little private organisation. And I was delighted to be given a letter by somebody where Julia Middleton had been in contact with Glynis Kinnock and uh, Eluned Morgan, and the subject was Brian Gerrish. So there's a nice little Welsh letter there, and on what it was saying was that everything I was saying was libelous, defamatory, untrue. And eventually they did send me a, solicitor, a, solicitor, a solicitor's letter. And in that letter I was threatened that if I didn't shut up they were going to take action against me. And they accused me of all these things, and I said, well, please provide the evidence. And then surprisingly nothing happened. But I found it very interesting that good old Julia Middleton should run to a lady like Kinnock. Now, I don't know whether anybody in this room is a great fan of her, but I'm afraid I'm not. And I'm certainly not a fan of her husband, because he said he was going to sort out the fraud in the EU, and he didn't. But I was obviously doing enough at that stage to worry common purpose, and all I was doing is saying, who are you? Who are your members? Where are they? What are they doing? Why are they doing it? And Julia Middleton didn't want to know. So she ran for help. Now this brings me to my story, really. And I'm going to do some stuff that I haven't done before, but it's very relevant to the fact we're talking about um, young people starting to self-harm or commit suicide. So... If I go back about, mm, probably about five years now, might be six, I'm losing track of the time, my phone rang one morning and one of my friends said, Brian, what are you doing today? And I said, well, I'm going to be in the office later. And he said, can I come in and see you? Can I bring a lady to see you? And I said, what for? And he said, well, she's not well. And I said, well, what, what do you expect me to do about it? And he said, well, you're the only person that knows about common purpose. So I was a bit bemused, but he, he was obviously desperate, so I said yes. 
And about 11 o'clock in the morning, my friend came in with a lady. Um, I later discovered she was 29, she was professional, she was educated, and she was in a bit of a state. In fact, she was very frightened. And her story was that she'd done a common purpose course. Um, some of her colleagues had done the course. And then she's doing her job within a quango in the southwest. And uh, one day her boss said to her, I think you should sleep with me. So she took exception to that and gave him the brush off. But she was a good lady, so part of it was taken as a joke and part of it was a pretty firm, no way, Jose. And she carried on with her work. About 10 days later, he, he was back again and he said, no, I really think that, uh, you know, we should, we should have it on because I've had mistresses before and I know how to treat a woman. So the lady then went to see the personnel manager and there was a fairly frank conversation about this man's behaviour. Um, the only trouble was, within two days, what had been discussed privately, confidentially, was all around the organisation. And everywhere the woman went for help, she found that things were twisted back against her. Well, you're the problem because you let him on, led him on. It's your fault. You did this. He's a very good man. And this began to play on her mind a bit because she knew what she was saying was correct, but everywhere she went for help, it was skewed against her. And then she decided the only thing to do was to go outside the establishment and go to some of the uh, proper places when you're being victimised and harassed. And then she was really frightened to find that the same thing was happening. She went to her solicitors and they turned against her. And she found everybody that was doing it was common purpose. This lady was frightened to the extent she was becoming paranoid. And I said to her, well, look, we know a few things about common purpose. And what I'm going to do is you're going to get, I'm going to give you my phone number. You can call me at any time of the day or night. But if something happens that you really don't like, you call me. And I said, we don't use baseball bats, but we know a few things. And we know a bit about this organization. Uh, but what I advise you is to get out of your job, go quiet for a bit, and then get another job and just you know, work on. And we kept track of her, and things quietened down, and eventually she got another job. And so we asked her very nicely whether she would come out with us, that was the original guy who brought her to me, um, to have a chat about Common Purpose. And she agreed, and we went to a pub, a quiet pub. And so I said, well, tell me about the course. Um, where did you do it? And she said, oh, we did it at the Dartmouth Golf and Country Club, which is a golf club that has a little tiny hotel. She said it was over a weekend. We went there on the Friday. It was Saturday, Sunday, and then we came home. And I said, tell me what happened. So I'm going to tell you as she told me. She said, well, we, uh, we, we, uh, uh, we got there and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and well, we... we we, um, we put our bags down and we had, had registration and, and, and we had a coffee. And I said, okay, and what did you do then? She said, we, 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 we played games. And I said, oh, this is interesting. What sort of games? And she said, well, well, uh, well there, there was the games with the plates. And I said, what was this then? She said, well, you had paper plates. And we had to, we, we, we had to write our names and, 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 and our jobs. And, uh, and then you had to put the plate on the table in the position you thought it was in real life. So if you were the chief executive of the council, perhaps your plate would be at the top. And if you were the, the, the road sweeper, your plate would be at the bottom. And we had to put our plates on the table. And I said, OK, well, what else did you do? Well, we, 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 we played, we, we did games. So I said, can you tell me any more? Well... She was having trouble. So I said, oh, okay, well, what happened in the evening? She said, oh, uh, Saturday night there was a dinner. But she said, there was quite a lot of drinking in the bar. And, and um, then I was surprised because people came in from the local area and they were very big wheels and they were in common purpose and I didn't know they were in common purpose. There were senior police officers and people in the fire station and, and people in the council. And yeah, it was strange. And I said, what else happened? And she said, well, she said, I think some of the men were getting extras. And I said, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, I, I, I think one of the women running the course was giving the men extras. 
I think I know what that meant. So I said, oh, well, okay. What happened on Sunday? Well, well, Sunday we, we did more of the same. Now, basically, this intelligent, educated lady could not tell me properly what she had done on a two-day course. She couldn't remember properly. And she was clearly distressed by trying to remember. So we ended the conversation by saying, well, everything's okay now, thank you very much. But she kindly gave us some notes. And, of course, in the course notes, we started to learn that when you try and apply to Common Purpose, you're actually selected and you have, to fill in, you have to fill in a questionnaire which includes personal detail about yourself. And I'm going to suggest to you what that questionnaire does is a form of psychological profiling. Now the next one is moving on a little bit. Keep, keep, keep this... Um, sorry, I've forgotten. Just go to the next slide. It's probably okay. But yeah. So... We move on a bit, and um, a reasonably young teenage girl was brought to me um, who had had a character change. She'd been at school, she'd been very bright, healthy, doing very well. Then she started to act quite wild. Mum and Dad thought maybe it was hormones. And then it became apparent that all was not well. And then it turned out that she was having extremely unpleasant dreams in colour of people having their heads blown off with shotguns. And uh, I got the opportunity to talk to, to this girl. And I'm going to say I was learning. I'd learned a bit at that stage. And so uh, with the opportunity to sit down with her, with a cup of tea and, and her mum in the background, I asked her a question straight off. And I said, what do you think of the EU? And she said to me, they, 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 always, they, they always said it, 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 it was a very good thing, but I, I, I didn't like the control. I, I, I didn't like the control. And I said, that's a very interesting answer. What, what's that mean? Well, they, they always said it was good, but I, I, really, I really didn't like the control. Would you agree that's a strange answer? So I said to the young girl, well... You've been suffering a bit, and uh, I've been suffering a bit because in Plymouth I've been threatened with death threats. I've had used hypodermic needles left in my house and flower baskets, and I've had business colleagues threatened, all because I started to discover things about a, an organisation, and it was called Common Purpose, and I've left my phone on. So, excuse me. So we had a little chat, but I couldn't go too far because the girl was not very well and her mum was very concerned about her. And so basically the deal was that we broke off, but I was beginning to form an opinion about this young lady. Sometime later, about three weeks, um, the mother s said to me that the girl would like to talk to me again. So I went to meet her and we sat down with a cup of tea and uh, I said, you were keen to have a chat. Well, I wonder whether you would, um, because I, I, I sort of remember things. I sort of remember things, but it, it's, it's weird, because I don't know whether I remember them or I'm dreaming them. And I said, that's very interesting. Can you tell me any more? And she s said, no, not really. But, and then she hesitated, and I said, well, okay. Do you remember a little course you did? where you were taken out of school with about seven or eight of your year group and you went into Plymouth to a house and you were given a course. Do you remember going to that course? And she said, yes. And I said, well, what happened on the course? And she said, it was weird. It was about future cities and society. And I said, well, what did they actually say? And she said, well, it, it was weird. It was weird. And then I said to her, do you remember the day you came home from school very upset because you said, all my friends say I've changed? And the girl said to me, that was horrific, ho horrible, really horrible. And I said, I'm going to let you into a little secret. You didn't change. They changed. What happened to you made you ill. 
because what's happened to you is somebody has messed with your mind. And now you know what's happened to you, you are going to start to get better. Now at this stage, this is about this is self-taught help. But I now know from specialists that what I was doing with this young lady were, was absolutely correct. And I can tell you that within the space of six weeks, she made a massive recovery. And within three months, she was back to 98%. But I'd formed an opinion that something had been done to that young teenager and the contemporaries in school that had affected them. I had the opportunity to try something out on a young teenage boy, 17 years old, and I was in a particular location uh, with a young man that I knew quite well. Uh, he was in, uh, he, he was in um, a kitchen unit at a particular facility making a cup of tea. And I said, good morning, John. What do you think of the Nazi party? And he said to me, what are you on? Which was a good reply. And I said, well, just humor me, because I'm a bit of an old fuddy-duddy. What do you think of the Nazi party? And he said, uh, he said um, well, they, uh, they, they, uh, they built the first roads. And that they were motorways, and they were concrete motorways, and, and there was a lot of people unemployed, and they started to get people back in employment. And they started to get Germany going. And this young man began to tell me the good works of the Nazi party. Don't misquote me on that. And I was fascinated. So I said to him, where did you learn this? Did you learn this in history or general studies? And he was very close, about the distance that Mike is here. And he was looking at me and he was frowning, a bit like Mike is. So I've asked him a simple question, where did you learn this? Did you learn it in history or did you learn it in general studies? And a huge lump came up on his forehead, like he'd been hit with a wooden mallet. And I'm thinking, whoa. And then in answer to my question, where did you learn this history or general studies, he said, I... I, I I, I, I don't know, I just assumed it. I just assumed it. It's a very interesting answer. So a bit later on in the day, I made a phone call to a friend of mine who's a very special man in his mid-70s, but he used to be special forces, and in the 60s, he was doing interesting things. And I told him the story, and he started to laugh. And I thought that was a bit unkind. And he said, no, no, he said, I'll tell you what's going on. He said, that young man's got information in his mind, but he doesn't know how it got there. And he said, when you ask him how it got there, you set up stress. And that stress is called cognitive dissonance, stress in the mind. He could have sweated. He could have rubbed his face. He could have yawned. He could have blushed, but you got a lump. And he said, don't know what's happened, but somebody somewhere has put information in that young man's mind and he doesn't know how it got there. Now, I'm going to give you one more story, but I've dealt with over 10 of these. A friend called me one sunny day and said, I have a lady in the depths of Cornwall who's very ill. Would you come and see her? And I said, what's the matter with her? And he said, well, she was working for the local authority. She was a very happy, professional lady. And then people came into her department and they started to bully her. And it was as though the two men wanted to take her department over. And when she resisted, they were really nasty, psychological bullying, intimidation, undermining her. And eventually it started to make her ill, so she had to have time off. And then when she had time off, the council started started to bully her more and say, well, if you're having all this time off, I'm not sure we can hold you on the books. So then she went to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist put her on Prozac and then she started to get more frightened and now she's in a terrible state and her husband's becoming ill because he's so worried about her. And I said, well, I'm not sure I can deal with this lady. And he said she hadn't got anybody else. Would you come? So I drove to the end of the land, Land's End, it's called, and I went to a very smart house, and I went in, and there was a lady in her mid-40s sitting on a sofa, and I'm going to say she was virtually dribbling. 
and I initially said, I don't think I should try anything with this lady because she's very unwell. And the guy said to me, please, because she hasn't got anybody else. So I sat down on the sofa. This was about half five. And I did what I sort of taught myself to do. And that was I started out by saying to her, I don't think you're very well. You're not very well. I may be able to help, but I'll tell you a bit about myself. And I spent over an hour telling her about me in a very relaxed way, but also saying I was starting to find funny things going on. And eventually I said to her, have you done any courses? And she said, yes. I won't slur like she did. And I said, what course have you done? She said, women, women in business, women in business. So I said, okay, where did you do that? She said, a hotel. I said, how long was it? She said, a weekend. And I said, can you remember who ran the course? And she gave me a lady's name. And I got a big tick in the box because I knew that lady was common purpose trained. It was incredible. So I said to her, can you remember what you did? I didn't really get anything out of her. So I then said, have you got any course notes? And she said, yes. And she went upstairs and she came back with what looked like a big scrapbook. And she also came back with a big ring file full of papers, just as you do if you're going to do a course. And I opened the scrapbook on the table and there was what looked like a children's crayon drawing. And in the top right-hand corner, to me, it looked like an angel. So I said to her, is that an angel? And she said, yes. And I said, who drew this picture? And she said, I did. And I said, why did you draw it? She said, we had to draw our first memories. Does anybody know what this is? This is regression therapy. Take somebody back to their very first memory. You can destroy somebody's personality doing this. And this woman had now given me all the ticks in the box. She'd gone to a course. It was over a weekend. It was with a special trainer. And she was now ill. And I knew why she was ill, because somebody had been messing around with her mind. So what I then did is the procedure. So I said, you feel horrible. You're very frightened. You think you're mentally ill. But I'm going to let you into a secret. You're not. Somebody's been playing with your mind. And now you know you're going to start to get better. I'm going to cut that bit short, but basically at half past nine, when her husband came home, and I thought he was going to try and fill me in because he was very worried about what was going on, she said, I I'll go and cook something. And by half eleven at night, this woman who had effectively been dribbling when I arrived was becoming animated and starting to hold a conversation. It took her three months to recover. And when she recovered, the trauma of what had happened to her in Cornwall was so great that they decided they were going to leave and go to Spain. I have dealt with over 10 of these cases, mainly women, but there were men as well. And one man who was very sad because he paid for his wife to do a common purpose course because he thought it would be good for her morale and professional ability. And then he watched her personality change. And eventually they started to have rows. And after 30 years of happy marriage, she left him for her boss, who was also common purpose trained. And I said to the man at one point, he was in my house. It was by that stage about 1 o'clock in the morning. I said, I think the only way I can describe this is it's a cult, but it's political. It's driving a political ideology. And he started crying. And I've seen grown, grown men cry before, but it's not a nice experience, really. And he said, I'm really sorry, but I kept telling myself it was a cult. And then I kept telling myself I was going off my head. And I said, well, you were absolutely right, because somebody's played around with your wife's mind, and you've started to see a personality change. When I started to put this information out on the internet, I got contacted by people all over UK. And that's when I began to understand that common purpose and offshoots of common purpose were beginning to do things which are very dark and very devious. And also, to a trained person, very easy to do. Okay, Mike. 
Now, just so we know it's real, and I am not pointing a finger at this company, I've just chosen it, but this is one of many consultancies that's now charging to do NLP type training. Come and improve your business skills, improve your life skills, change your life, change your vision. Do whatever you want to achieve. Come and have NLP training. There are hundreds of these consultancies all over the country. What most of them don't tell you is this. There is no regulation over NLP practitioners. You can be a psychotherapist tomorrow. Go and have your brass sign made up, stick it on your door, psychotherapist. And you are entitled to read books and try out these procedures on people with absolutely no controls whatsoever. In America, there are NLP websites saying to men, come and learn NLP, because then you can NLP women into bed with you, and they won't even know that they're doing it against their will. This is assault. It's real. There is a massive explosion of this stuff via networks across the country, and the key part is it is unregulated, and almost none of these organizations talk about the risks. Now, this is where we start to get in amongst the risks. This is a document produced by a teacher who reported on a course she did in Leeds in September 2005. I'm going to say, trust me, because there's a lot of words, and I'm going to talk you through it. I know this is real, because I spoke to Leeds. I actually got a copy of the contract out of them for the training. I was able to track down the trainer. I was able to ask him questions. I know at the time the training took place, there was no signed contract. Because there was no signed contract, there was no public insurance in place. And these were teachers who went on a creative visualization course in order to learn how to do this with young children, six, seven, eight. And what this teacher said is after doing this course, two of her colleagues got very dark, disturbing images in their minds which they couldn't get rid of. And in this report, which is four pages long, she says, if this is what was happening to us as adults, what was going to happen in the mind of young people who were given this type of training? And that's a pretty serious thing to ask, isn't it? But I can tell you at the time, Leeds, Education Leeds, was not only doing this training, it was ramming similar training out across the whole of their um, city area. And of course, when we dug into it, we found that Common Purpose was at work in that area as well. And this is a tiny bit of a spreadsheet which showed the common purpose was sitting down with local council people saying, out of your education budget, you can give us five grand at the beginning of the year and another five grand later on. So a charity, which I will tell you is operating politically, was buried in amongst the education system of Leeds. And I can tell you that common purpose is buried in the education system right the way across the country except they don't bother to tell the parents. Now, the trouble with NLP is, I'll qualify. I believe I can say, quite happily, NLP is a bit like a surgeon's knife. The right person could use it to help people. And I have some very good and highly trained NLP people who are helping me, because they are also worried about what's happening. So let's say it's a tool, and if you use it in the wrong way, it causes a problem. So I'm not getting at every therapist who uses NLP. The trouble with NLP is it has many different variant forms. And I've put here a list, and I've named various things. Have any of you in this audience come across this? Have you heard your children talking about any of these things? What, what have you heard? Show and tell. Yeah. Right. So something is brought from home, and amongst all the other children, they tell about this item. 
except that children can bring quite personal items. And what they're actually starting to do is reveal the personal side of their life in front of other people. Now, some of this has gone on for years, and it's been quite okay. But what I'm gently going to say is there are new techniques being buried in it. So there was another hand. Helen, was it you? Right. So you're saying that my list is pretty accurate. These stuff, this stuff is going on in schools. Down at the bottom left column, it says debating a view the child does not hold. So there's a subject chosen. And the subject is the sort of subject that most people will not agree with whatever's being proposed. Their, their instinct, their common sense says, no, that's not right. And then some of the children are chosen to argue for something they don't believe in. This is very, very dangerous because what it is starting to do is break down their sense, their instinct as to what is right and wrong. Creative visualization is absolutely NLP where children are encouraged to imagine images. And in some cases, they're also encouraged to speak to imaginary people in their minds. This is dangerous. And the danger for small children is they've got minds like sponges and they can suck this stuff in. Now, what my very highly qualified NLP friend told me is that if you give NLP to a person who is basically sound and well mentally and physically, what you're doing doesn't really cause a problem because we all go into trances. If you've ever driven your car, and you can't remember a certain section of the road, you've gone into a little trance, you're still steering, hopefully, okay, but you can't quite remember it. Oh, I don't remember going past that junction. So trances are quite normal. And in a healthy person, you can help introduce a trance in order to help recover them from a particular phobia or fear or perhaps emotional situation. If you have a person who has some inherent mental problem, perhaps they're mentally ill or they've got a propensity to being depressed, and you start to give them NLP, the risk of an adverse effect increases dramatically. And basically, if people are given NLP from different directions at a time, so one person giving them NLP doesn't know what other NLP they're getting, you are screwing up their heads very quickly indeed. Now, the man who gave the school teacher in Leeds the course, I challenged him and I said, is your, is your creative visualization safe? And he said, oh, yeah. So I said, well, is it 100% safe? And he said, well, no, because nothing's 100% safe. And I said, okay, well, how unsafe is it? Is it? And he said, well, very small. And I said, well, give us a figure, 10%? And he said, oh, no, no, no. And I said, well, give me a percentage then. He said, well, it, well, about 1%. So I said, so you expect in 1% of the cases there to be some form of adverse effect? He said, well, it'd probably be quite mild. So I said, 1%. Well, it, well I, I suppose in occasions it could be, you know, 1, 1, 1.5%. 1.5%. If you are doing this to 100,000 school children, how many do you think you're going to see with signs of illness at 1%? 1,000. 1,000. At 2%, 2,000. I can prove to you that NLP in many different variant forms is being pumped through our young people by organizations and groups that we think are there for the public benefit. And some of the people administering the NLP in its particular variants are not even properly trained in it, and they are certainly not trained in the risks. Some of the NLP sites say after people have had NLP training in their consultancies, they must not drive for several hours afterwards. A woman who put a glowing report on a consultancy site who worked for the, for the Department for Education 
said, I had a wonderful course and John was such a wonderful instructor and I met so many wonderful people. It was some of the best training that I've ever done. And I think I accidentally tranced some of my class because they had their hands in the air and they wouldn't take them down until I told them. This woman who was employed in the education system was boasting that she was putting a whole class into a trance and she thought it was funny. This is unbelievably dangerous. And if you look at where all these initiatives are coming from, they are coming straight through our government and public sector. Pumped through them. To the extent that the UK column has exposed it's real. We printed the names, we printed the documentation, that the Cabinet Office is running a behavioural change programme whereby there is a behavioural change unit in every public department. That is a fact. What the government doesn't say is that this form of applied behavioural psychology has risks. You don't know it's being done to you. It can make you mentally ill. An adult has a certain amount of protection. A young child has no protection. So we know what we're looking for. The lady at top left is, is now in charge of counter-terrorism in Britain. Her name's Cressida Dick. She is a very, very senior common purpose trained lady. And I'm going to say that some police officers very close to her tell us that she is very, very strange. And I said, really, how strange? And they said, well, actually, we think she's off her rocker. Now, I don't know whether those officers are telling the truth, but it makes sense to me because the more times you allow yourself to be NLP'd, the more confused you get. And one of the NLP specialists said, Brian, a simple example is if you buy a new laptop and you're really pleased with it, it's got lots of memory, it's got a great processor, you run programs, it runs like a dream, and then you think, I'll have that screensaver, I like that game, I like that calendar, I like that photograph, and it all gets stuffed on. If you imagine all those things are little NLP programs, eventually your mind does what the computer does. It starts to hang up, it starts to freeze, it starts to shut down. So he said, you can give somebody a little dose of NLP, doesn't do much. Six months later, you give them another little dose. Six months later, you give them another little dose. Two years later, they are not the same person. Now, I don't know whether we've got any police officers buried in the audience in strange clothes. I hope we have, because one of the areas that we know is beginning to suffer is within the police. And there's an increase at the moment in police suicides. But there's something else going on. There was an article, I think it was in the mail, where a police officer said, I can't have my photograph taken on this bike because I haven't done my bike safety course. And the press said, this is nonsense, this is crazy, this is madness. The, the, the policeman wouldn't get on the bike just to have a photo taken. And what I say to you, it wasn't crazy, it wasn't ridiculous, because in the policeman's head... He couldn't get on the bike because he couldn't do the course. His frame of reference had been changed. I got a call from a lady who said that a police partner, policeman partner of 17 years, did a diversity course. And she said he changed. But I tried to find out about the course. And one evening we went out for a drink and we went with two of his colleagues. One of them was a black police officer. And she said, I can't think what he's called. Cool. Well, I'll forget it, actually, so we'll call him David. She said, I spoke to David and said, uh, did you do the diversity course? And he said, yes. She said, well, what, did, what happened on it? He said, well, they asked lots of questions. You come off shift, you come back to the station, you get asked to do this. Is that because you're black? Well, not really. They ask all the blokes to do that. Well, this, this and this happens. Is that because you're black? Well, no. No, not really. I don't think so. Well, this happens. Is, is that because you're black? Well, well, I suppose, suppose possibly. Well, what about this then? Is, is that because you're black and you're different from the rest? Well, I suppose you could be right. What they did is they took a man who was quite happy with his colleagues and they put little seeds of doubt in his mind. And what this policeman said, if I didn't know I was fucking black before the course, I do now. 
Well, the woman said her white police husband changed. She said he became very domineering and he would be looking at the television saying, do you see that lot out there? That's what we've got to deal with. That's what I have to put up with, those people out there. They're like animals. And she said, after so many months, they went away for a holiday in a caravan. And by the middle of the week, she said, I had to leave him. I knew I had to leave him because he was different. He was changed. Now, I could give you two hours on people talking about dealing with the police. And they say some of them are not right. And I've got policemen now contacting me with stories about their colleagues who are not right. Some of them are actually showing signs of mental breakdown. And there are some of them in South Wales. And basically, these officers are being given courses. Can I prove it? I'm sorry, it's not a good slide, but this is an organisation called Chillington Associates. It's an NLP company, and they boast that they're training police officers and doing psychometric tests and running leadership for the police. What the policemen don't realise is that when they're doing these training courses, they are being given training with a form of NLP. They don't even recognise that it's coming through. And with NLP, as my expert says, Brian, give me somebody for 40 minutes in a room with no windows and they will not know which school they went to. This is very powerful, dangerous stuff in the hands of the wrong people. What happens when this type of stuff gets in the hands of people that have got a rather devious political ideology? Have you talked to people recently that you've found very sort of aggressive and unhelpful? You talk to somebody in the local council, it's not sir or madam, how can I help you? You get treated almost like you're a nuisance or a piece of shit. Excuse my French. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Or you talk to somebody and they don't seem to be at home. You look at their eyes and it's almost like the hamster wheel's going round, but Hammy Hamster isn't in the wheel. Or you have a conversation where you are describing one thing and they answer as though they haven't actually grasped what you said to them. And you may not pick this up immediately, but I get people now calling all the time saying, whoa, my colleagues, they're just not acting normally. And the reason is that they've been interfered with. This shouldn't be here, really. <laughs> but it's quite useful because this was what was going on in my mind of how we actually show what's going on. Because if I dig back into history, I can find that all sorts of stuff has been going on which people have been telling you. Hitler said, give me the children and I don't care about this generation because I control future generations. Communist Chinese go for the children. They always go for the children because then they control what's going to happen in the future. Um, psychotropic dr drugs being handed out like candy. A military guy came to, to see me about a month ago, an army man back from Afghanistan, damaged back. He'd got some stories to tell. He'd gone through a rehab center. He got painkillers for his back. And then they said to him, we'd like you to go on to Prozac. And he said, what for? And they said, well, it's a preventative measure in case you get post-traumatic stress in the future. He said, get off, I'm not taking that. They said, you have to. He said, I'm not taking it. He said, Brian, I've, I, I've got mates who came back from Afghanistan and Iraq, and they were fine when they came back, although they were missing part of a leg or they'd got wounds or some damage. And he said, they've been on these drugs, they're off their heads. And these drugs are being given to children, especially children that they can lever away from their parents. So I've put there some of the things that I was thinking about. We know in the States, this is absolutely true, children are being given questionnaires. If they give the wrong answers, they're immediately put alongside children's services. And they're prescribed Ritalin. And I'm going to say the same system is beginning to drift into UK schools. Don't believe me tonight. Go away and check it. Sorry about the text. 
I should have uh, blown this one up. But basically, these, this was just um, a little text saying the types of NLP that was being undertaken by a variety of people in the public sector. They're all at it. Police, NHS, social services, children's services. They're all giving training which has got embedded NLP in it. These are nasty little posters that are appearing around the place which are actually playing on people's minds. This is written NLP. You may look at this and you think, oh, that's nothing. Your conscious brain has dismissed it. Your subconscious has read it. And these nasty little posters are designed to cause problems. I know a local primary school that has never had a problem with bullying in 30 years. I walked into it, uh, well, it was about nine months ago, and as I came in through the entrance doors, I was amazed to see a poster oppos opposite me talking about bullying, what to do if you're bullied. And I said to one of the teachers, what's that poster doing there? You've never had bullying in this school. She said, I know, but we have to have that poster. So I said, well, now you've got bullying. Because in the children's mind, if the poster's up there talking about bullying, well, bullying obviously exists. This is NLP. It's very dangerous. This is a quango, which is actually talking about um, what the coali coalition government is doing with big society. And big society is actually talking about a neighborhood army, a neighborhood army of 5,000 people. And what it goes on to talk about is what sort of training they're going to be giving that army. And they start mentioning a man called Alinsky. And I hoped you will go home and put Alinsky into Google because you will find a man who in the late 70s and 80s was looking at how you could use this twisted psychology to destroy Western societies. And now I can show you documents where it is embedded in both the conservative and the labor policy. Alinsky. Okay, thanks. And there's a bit of text, okay. According to the coalition government, community organizers will play an important role in delivering the big society. The policy is based on the principles of Saul Alinsky and Paulo Freire, who was a Brazilian educationalist. If you look at Alinsky's book, which is called Rules for Radicals, it is... Don't <laughs> It is, um, what's the word? I was going to say donated, dedicated to Lucifer. I'm not making this up, it's dedicated to Lucifer. And he talks about ways of destroying established democratic societies by infiltrating them and messing around with people's minds. He's being used a lot in America. All of this stuff is going on at the moment. I have never watched it. Channel 4, Joy, Joy of Teenage Sex. Has anybody seen it? If you have, I'm told it's absolutely explicit and disgusting. And what we're seeing is this massive sexual attack on children. I've forgotten to call it up in this, in this uh, presentation, but I've got a document, a study done by a university. Could have been Nottingham, but may be wrong on that. And what the study said is that where children are taught pretty graphic sexual stuff at an early age, six and seven, the suicide rate in boys of boys increases. And this is actually to do with teaching homosexuality to boys at a very early age. The university report says the more graphic it is, the earlier you teach it, the greater the suicide rate in boys. This is never published. This is never put in the public domain. There's a man called Soros in the background. And he is funding. You can go on to his site, George Soros. You can see him talking about putting huge sums, like $1.9 billion, into community change groups. Now, if you do your research on Mr. George Soros, you'll find he's an international banker. Nobody knows how much he's worth. He boasts that in the Second World War, he was one of the people that stripped Jews of assets. And he's quite proud of it. 
I think he's a nasty piece of work. And we can track, and I know there are people in the audience because they've been helping me with some of this stuff, we can show that George Soros organizations and money is pumping through the weird stuff that's now appearing in South Wales. Sounds unbelievable, doesn't it? But it's true. And I have grave concerns about Harry Potter. I don't know how many of you have watched Harry Potter films. How many? They've all got worse. They've all got darker. They've all got more graphic. And I find it very interesting that um, J.K. Rowling has been producing books on magic for school children with Sarah Brown, Gordon Brown's wife. And of course, if you look at her going to Exeter University, Exeter University boasts that it's Europe's principal uh, university for the occult and witchcraft. That's interesting, isn't it? Fascinating. So, okay, I've put two slides in there. This was a repeat of the teaching freedom one. Just jump over that one. This is the stuff that children are looking at at the moment. So never mind what's happening at school. If they're on the internet and they're watching stuff, there are now more and more short film clips or people with uh, songs and lyrics talking about suicide. And this idiot has got this particular one, Our Love Suicide. Is he talking about our love suicide or is he talking our love is suicide? This is dangerous stuff and whoever produced the song and who's ever paying for it to go out knows that it's dangerous. I couldn't play this. We, we actually had a slight, slight hitch with some of the music. But if you listen to this guy on uh, YouTube, 11 million people have listened to this. He says, if we don't kill ourselves, we will live in a mixed up, gen we will lead a mixed up generation. So never mind what I'm telling you about what's going on at school. If, if your children aren't warned, you can't stop them in my opinion, but you can warn them so that when they cease, oh, that's dangerous. But this is very, very dangerous stuff because this music straight into your subconscious mind. Now this is where it gets really interesting. This is a lovely little film company called First Light. Do you know who pays for them? Well, we do. Because they're funded by the National Lottery amongst other people and the Arts Council of England and Wales. And this is a lovely little film about a dog committing suicide. And it was, was made by 14-year-olds. And this company is boasting of actually having made this film. I'll tell you, the dog actually doesn't hang himself because he finds it doesn't work. So he's very distressed and staggers around for a bit and then decides it's better if he goes and runs in front of a lorry. That was produced by 14-year-old children. I would like to have a meeting with the people who worked with those children. This is, um, this is more of their efforts. Uh, this, this October half-term, First Light ran a horror-filled three-day workshop for 11 to 14-year-olds to make their very own horror film. I've watched one. It's called The Gravestone Girl, which is at the bottom, and it's pretty, pretty horrific about a little doll murdering people. And these twisted people are actually getting at our children and getting their minds into this very dangerous stuff. And where's it coming from? Lottery money. And you need to, sorry, start looking at, yeah, start looking at uh, what's happening with creative drama in Wales. They're tied up with this man, Alfoldi. He was running theatre companies in Hungary until the Hungarian government said, your theatre work is so dark, dirty, depraved and horrible, if you don't clean it up, we're going to sack you. And in this particular text, a reporter from one of the TV stations said, do you think that a 12-year-old should be watching your play, which contained oral sex? And he said, oh, absolutely, and I hope you enjoy as much oral sex as possible. So the Hungarians put a stop to this man. Do you know where he's producing plays now? South Wales, Welsh National Theatre. Start having a look at what is going on through creative arts and you will find unbelievably dark, dirty, filthy, 
deprived plays, also with the theme of suicide. This is more stuff from the internet, but this is sort of like um, a Facebook club, which is called the Suicide Club, and it was known that a lot of the youngsters in South Wales were looking at this. Do I think this did it for them? No. Because I think that the ones who succumbed to suicide were, had already been weakened mentally by all the rest of this, can I say, crap that's been forced through their minds. Let's get a bit personal. Rudri is a small little village just outside of Cardiff. And I'm told it's in decline or has been for some time. So the shop's gone, the post office has gone, garage, I think, has gone. And what was left was a tin shed of a village hall. All of a sudden, the Welsh Assembly gives it a grant of £600,000. Of course, we're desperately short of money, aren't we? We haven't got much money. So Rudri Parish Community gets £600,000. And when they get this money, they start to run very strange plays for children. And this is one of the plays. It's too dark on the screen, but if you can see it properly, there's a boy in a black jumper, and his face has been graffitied out. Can you see that? Except if you look closely, he's holding the chalk in his hand, so he's graffitied out his own face. Shall I tell you what the subconscious image is? Self-mutilation. And if you can see the poster properly, you can also see that the boy's wet himself. You won't see it because it's too dark. And then if you look at it closely, you see, well, he's got a church behind him, but what's he wearing on his head? It's a Ku Klux Klan hat, isn't it? The spire looks as though it's a hat. And I'm going to say to you, and you can check this out yourselves, that the, the plays being pushed through Rudri Village Hall are unbelievably dark and unpleasant. And this is not accidental because somebody's pumping in money and bringing in the children to be dosed. Okay, so this is getting on a bit. This is more of the theatre work that's happening in South Wales. And what I'd like to point out to you, if you think your children and youngsters aren't being exposed to it, they absolutely are, because some of it is put into a sort of video form directly to be brought through schools. So this is another play, Bondage, Burps and Human Sacrifice. And it says at the end, high art, but probably you don't want to walk through the woods on your own afterwards. The Welsh Government, the Welsh Assembly is paying for this filth. And what we know is going on, that aside from the actual theatre work, we're also seeing that NLP techniques are being used in the play. Now, I had hoped to show a bit of film, but there was a problem with my computer, and I couldn't get it loaded. But one of the films actually shows at the start of one of their plays, very dark, very nasty, very sinister, and then it switches to another clip where initially you're looking at an attractive girl, and then she's pushed, and as she falls backwards, you see that she's a thalidomide victim, and she hasn't got any arms. These images are being used deliberately because they actually destabilize people. And the so-called creative artists know exactly what they're doing. And I can tell you that using art as a form of attack on people's minds is a very, very old psychological technique. Right. Okay. I decided I'd, I would leave this in because it was in the mainstream... Um, uh, press, but it was a young girl in the Midlands that committed suicide and basically the mother was saying that um, the trouble is that a lot of the people that come in to help, the self-styled suicide gurus, they come in and they pride themselves on, on telling people about how to commit suicide and one guy has come into the South Wales area, I've got him on um, a future slide, I can't remember his name now, but I can tell you that people have come into the South Wales area talking about how to commit suicide, and they're proud of it. How much do you know about the United Nations? How many of you think it's a good thing? 
If you go on YouTube, you can find very interesting analytical film clips talking about the UN. And they usually tell you an interesting fact that one of their publishing companies was originally called the Lucifer Printing Company. It's now called the Lucis Trust. And if you follow the UN through, people who were involved in its early setup were occultists. I believe that the UN is something which is not very nice because I think the agenda is a single world government. But the United Nations produces a huge amount of material about what the curriculum should be in schools. And I can tell you that Wales is being used as the gateway for raw United Nations policy. I haven't got time to cover this in this talk, but I assure you what I'm telling you is true. So this is a document, teacher's notes. It's come from the United Nations, and in it, it says something very interesting. And of course, I'm going to the wrong slide. If, I, if you just come back, come back. It'll probably appear in a minute. What it actually says is that when people join the UN, they swear an oath of allegiance that they will not take instructions from any foreign government. So you join the UN, and the only person or organization you're accountable to is the UN. Now that's interesting because the UN is pushing teaching material and stuff to do with mainstream curricula straight down into the British education system. But apparently they are unaccountable to the government. Please research it yourself. Now this is more stuff that's been coming around. This is a nice little book called Smithereens, an anthology that offers students the opportunity to enjoy, investigate, respond and write short stories. It's come out of o Oxford. It's being used in the teaching circuit, so it must be good if we have a closer look at it. A childhood psychologist said it should be immediately removed from schools because it starts talking about suicide, deaths, murders, and getting the students to comment in detail on what's actually happening. And under the book, it says, as a little example, imagine before she committed suicide, Nola wrote two messages, one to her parents and one to Peter. Write them both, making them different in subject and tone. So that was the instruction to children to write two suicide notes. And this idiot is buried in Oxford University that we all think is such a wonderful seat of learning. This is um, Norfolk Schools. And this young man, I don't think he's a bad man, but basically he's running NLP courses for the children in Norfolk Schools. I've spoken to him on the phone. He's no idea of the risks of what he's doing, but I want to prove to you that what I'm talking is real. bit more on the Welsh theatre, In Your Face, and a guy called Alvarez, 1971, is talking directly about suicide, 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 suicide. And what's interesting, when you follow the threads through, hanging, hanging, hanging. I'm an ex-military person, and I look at this, and my brain is saying somebody's attacking us and they're doing it from inside, and they're going for the vulnerable, which is the children. Now, I've been deliberately a little bit coy on this because some of this work isn't finished. But in this area, uh, the column, if you like, it starts with an organization called Papyrus at the top, and then it's got Bridge End This and the Mental Health Wales. Those are all the organizations which are supposedly working to stop the suicides. When I contacted some of them to say, have you ever looked at these areas? Phew, it's like a wall went up. They didn't want to talk to me. You would have think I was offering them poison. I said, do you know actually much about NLP and what damage it can do and which organizer are giving the children NLP? They did not want to speak to me. So I started to get rather suspicious about what these organizations are doing. What I will say to you is I am sure that people in the organizations think they're doing a good job, but I don't think they are looking for the right cause for the suicides. 
because they don't understand what NLP is, and they also don't understand they are also using NLP in trying to give counselling and therapeutic advice to vulnerable children. Sorry, just go back, Mike, just very quickly. If you see the blue blob in the middle, that's actually a pamphlet. And I found the pamphlet by going to an organisation called Let's Talk, which is one of the help units. And I checked them through, and I found they were linked to a, a church called the Bethlehem Church. Does anybody know it? Yeah, Bethlehem Church, and they were doing lots of good things and everything else. And so I raked around on their website, and I found that blue pamphlet. And that's what the blue pamphlet looks like. And it's saying that people involved with the church, especially younger people who want to get on with their lives and really achieve something and live the beautiful life, should do this course called A Year Out. Now, I don't know what this poster is about, but it looks like a man crucified and he's got a thumbprint on his back, and it says DNA, and the writing doesn't seem to be Christian to me. Do you know what I'm getting at? Now, when my NLP expert saw it, he said, whoa, this little poster is full of hidden messages. So he knew that this poster had been drawn up because the person doing it knew what they were doing with NLP. And I'm going to suggest to you, this is a very dark, dirty little course which is designed to suck young people in through the churches. This is Downing Street doing nudging. And B BBC went in and did a little audio interview with them. So you don't believe me, check it for yourself. And in that audio interview, none of the people gave their full names. They only gave their first names. And they were all rather giggly and, yes, we're doing a great job. What they are doing is designing applied psychology programs for the government which are being used on all of us. And, of course, they only sell it with good stuff. Oh, we're only helping people to be more timely in paying their taxes. That's only what you see. What's happening behind, they are actually working to change all sorts of behaviour that we've got they don't like. And if they can do it through the children, they'll do it. If you're going to do something really nasty, what do you do? You cover it up. So if you watch the government at the moment, the government's, oh, it's doing so many things to make us happy. Never mind about jobs and food prices and fuel prices and everything else. What's actually being done is we're being gradually pulverized into the ground so along come these initiatives and quangos and charities which are supposedly helping our well-being. And I'm going to suggest something to you. And it's a challenge because if you prove me wrong, give me a call. But I'm going to suggest to you that every time you see a document that says it's helping your well-being, it's actually something the exact opposite. Because I think that what is actually attacking us at the moment is very dark and twisted. So look at documents, think them through, and I think you will start to see that what's actually being proposed isn't good at all. Now where does this come from? Now this is a little document in 1942. I know this is heavy, but I'm going to say stick with me. And it's a guy called Rhys Rawlings. And in 1942, he wrote this little paper that said, when the war is won, when we've won the war, we need to get our people in every sector of society, of which the two most difficult will be medicine and the law. But he doesn't quite define his people, except to say that basically they're talking about mental hygiene. Mental hygiene, interesting little phrase. And what he means by mental hygiene is that people are not mentally normal, mentally okay, unless they believe in all the agenda and idea that the, states put, the state puts forward. Now, this man went on to become head of the World, he World Health Organization, which takes us straight back to the UN. And if you look at all the mental health initiatives and policies that are coming through this country, 
they're not just coming from the government, they're coming straight from the UN. Common Purpose talks about future leaders. If I go to the UN, I can find strategy documents saying that every country's got to help promote future leaders. This is not a coincidence. This is another old paper from February 1946, and this is psychiatrists actually saying how there needs to be many more psychiatrists in order to make sure that people become mentally healthy. We need psychiatrists to make people mentally healthy. If I talk to the mums and dads who've had their children stolen, the people who did most damage around them are psychiatrists and psychologists who lied, produced false reports, bullied children, bullied mothers, bullied fathers. Am I saying they're all bad? No. Am I saying there's some nasty people in the middle of them? Yes. And if you track back through history, you can see the documents. Now this brings us back to this book. And this is the book that really started my mind going because it was given to me. It's a real pig to read because aside from the main text, there's very tiny notes. But when I sat down with my cup of tea, there was a little table which is on the left-hand side as you look at it. And I read it and I thought, my God. And I reread it and I read it again. And what my brain said, this is subversion. And I thought, this is straight out of the warfare manuals. This is sort of Marxist subversion. Now, what I've got on the screen is an early version of the table in that book. And this is from the 1970s. And somebody had said that in 15 to 20 years, they could completely demoralize a Western society. And so on the left, ideas and structure. In the middle, what they were going to do, and the right-hand column is the result. Law and order, legislative, not moral, so that people begin to mistrust justice. How many of you mistrust justice at the moment? It's rotten. If we go on a screen, family. What does it say about families? It says we're going to break it up. We're going to break up families because then the state can actually claim. What the state can claim is not the adults, it's the children. Now, if you think this is fiction, I can tell you if you read real Marxist Soviet warfare books, it reeks of this stuff. It's real. And I'm going to say to you what you're starting to see is it being driven through our society. Now, the first part was demoralization. I believe we are very close to the destabilization where they're trying to get in the violence on the streets. This is scary stuff, but I'm going to say towards the end that we can do things. This is little groups operating in South Wales intervening on mental health. Who are these people? What training have they had? What do they really know about mental health? If you listen to MIND, I think it's the charity MIND, MIND says one in four people have got mental health problems. Really? I don't think so. I think we're being told this so they can push through the drugs and the psychiatrists. Behavioural change. This is a project, I'm going to say, a good one on the surface, where they were trying to stop youngsters lighting fires. And Councillor Rob Goff, Cabinet Member for Public Protection of Caerphilly, Curric County Borough Council, said it's creating a permanent behaviour change. Wow. Okay, it's positive, yes, because you don't want children starting fires, but we're putting them through a training program that permanently changes their behaviour. And I'm going to say, for every positive program, there's a really devious, nasty program that nobody's being told about. Okay. And here's MIND. This is the charity that's helping everybody. And this is text talking about forms of NLP. Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, it's a form of NLP. And what the text says 
is that some people who were given CBT started to suffer adverse effects. They dropped, they became frustrated or dropped out of treatment. They sometimes, it sometimes caused distress amongst emotionally sensitive clients. So here is mind admitting that the techniques they're using were actually damaging people. What they don't tell you is what the percentages are. And what I will tell you, and I want to reinforce it because my NLP experts are saying this is the case, is that many of the people administering these NLP variants have no idea how dangerous they are. And this is being paid for with our money. Here's the Arts Council um, looking at cinemas in, in uh, Ireland and Wales and what the strategic plan is for them. Did you know that? You don't just have a cinema down the road. Your council's looking at a strategic plan across the country. Shall I tell you why? Because they're part of the prop propaganda machinery. They want to know who's, who's going to the cinema. They want to know what films are being shown because they want to know what the impact on our minds is. This is a document from the Bilderbergers. How many of you know about the Bilderbergers? It's real. Our politicians, Rory Stewart is a Bilderberger. Ed Balls is a Bilderberger. And this document is a Bilderberger document where it says that we've got to break the lower classes. We've got to keep them subservient. We've got to keep them badly educated. We've got to keep them poor. We've got to work them because in that state, they're not going to bother us, the elite. And in one of the other talks that I've given, I've given documents where Tony Blair said that part of his agenda was to create a new elite class and how they were going to work to create these elite political individuals. So the Bilderbergers not only said they were going to suppress ordinary people, they also talk about the fact that they don't want anybody with any real education and I was shocked when I discovered some of the things that my children were being taught at school. Absolutely shocked. And I was like most people. I trusted the schools as to what was being given to the children. But if you go into schools, particularly primary schools, go into the library and have a look at the books on the shelves. And you will find books unbelievably dark. And they are not there by accident. They're there by design because somebody's attacking us. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there because the subject is very, very dark. I can't show you all the information that we've got on this subject. I can only give you a taster of it. But if you start to delve into what is actually happening around young people, they are being subjected to a massive attack. There's the pressures at school, there's the drink, there's the easy access to drugs, watch TV. How many of you saw um, Sherlock Holmes last episode? Anybody see it? It ends by Sherlock Holmes talking to a man on a rooftop and you're watching it and at a particular moment the other man throws his head back and opens his mouth, he then produces a gun and shoots himself through the mouth. And you think, woof. And after that there's about 10 minutes of program of Sherlock Holmes deciding he's going to commit suicide. And he jumps off the roof of a four-story building and you see him fall and you see him smash himself to pieces on the pavement and you see the blood and the hair and the head. And this is prime time viewing before people go to bed. If you talk to people about why the BBC is producing, I think it's BBC producing that stuff, and it's brushed off, it's, it's adult, there may be bad language, it may deal with disturbing. They know it's disturbing because the programming is designed to s disturb people. So if your children are watching that as well, they're playing video games, all of this stuff is coming out at them, but the bit which I believe is triggering it is the fact they are being given NLP where images, ideas, intentions are being deliberately put into their heads. 
and I could give you another two hours on the other people that I've helped who have actually come along with problems where they're showing severe mental problems. They're not mental illness. They've been interfered with. If we want to do something about this, it requires the community to start asking the right questions. So at the moment, out there, there are counsellors. They got interested initially. Now they don't care. They've gone back to sleep. You need to wake them up. You need to say, what is this NLP? Why is it being given to the children? What are the risks? You need to be on the phone to Mind. You need to be on the phone to Papyrus. You need. Did you know there's a task force, a bridge end task force to pre prevent suicides? It was created. Yep. Have you got their report? I asked for their report. Uh, 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 um, I don't think there is a report. Okay. So let's start asking why there's not a report. But the thing to get into is look at the organisations who claim to help the children. If they're going into schools stopping bullying, what they're actually doing is putting the seeds of bullying in their heads. Diversity training sounds good because we ought to get on with people, whatever their colours, religions. The diversity training is the thing sparking the aggression. Yeah, it sounds unbelievable. You look for the evidence yourself. And the evidence in South Wales is overwhelming that something is going on so bad that we've got this massive increase in suicides. Now, I believe that because so many families here have been affected by it, and I'm told that somebody knows a family member or another family member or a friend of a family who knows about the suicides, that this community can actually take the lid off this thing. And I'm going to suggest to you that the reason that Swansea Council is so terrified, was so terrified of me talking to you tonight, is because people inside the council, same rule, they're not all bad, but we know that there's some very nasty people at work in the public sector. Those people knew that I was going to come and tell facts and truth and they are very frightened that the lid is coming off they are very frightened that the lid is coming off child stealing and what is happening to children supposedly in care now i'm told in one of the authorities not too far from here there's a big investigation going on into the fact that a young girl was stolen many years ago and i can tell you i have seen the documentation and the court paperwork that says that that young girl was taken unlawfully from her mother at gunpoint in America. And in the UK column office, Michael confirmed this, some weeks we're getting six, seven calls during the week from p parents, often the mother, sometimes fathers, off their heads because they say their children are being stolen from them. It's unbelievable. We want to stop it. You guys have got to do it. You're the community. All you need to do is start acting in a loose way together, asking the right questions. And you're going to see these people run a mile. Sorry it's such a dark subject. Thanks for listening.